Okay, everybody, if I can have your attention real quick. Um, thank you so much for joining us here and online. Uh, I think we don't have anybody just a second online, but we'll go ahead and leave the channel open in case uh, anybody jumps on. But we are recording this, so for the presentation, I'm going to have Brett kind of stand in this general area so that the microphone could pick him up while he's talking. Um, but I really do, since it's a, a nice group of us here in person today, um, I want to let everybody know, let's feel free to have a conversation as Brett presents. This is the first in-person one that we've had in a little while, so that's super exciting to me. Um, I'll give a quick introduction of who Brett is before he introduces himself further. Uh, Brett Boffman and I met freshman year of college, and probably the thing that stands out to me most about Brett is his ingenuity and creativity. This is a man who built a mech suit of armor for himself out of cardboard and duct tape in our freshman dorm. And then sophomore year came up with the idea of a Hunger Games themed food drive that was so massively successful that um, uh, OSU sponsored it officially. And he was able to actually make a film uh, associated with the Hunger Games aspect of the, uh, the, the program. So if you have any questions about that, it's pretty cool. Ask him. Um, you're up, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we can just play this real chill. I'm a pretty uh, casual and laid back guy. So if you guys have like questions or anything, I think they're true. You'll just feel free to ask them. Um, yeah, thanks for the shout out of the, like, the cardboard mech suit. Yeah, that was, uh, that was cool. It was the final uh, thing I did. Um, but, you know, I'm not necessarily a business mogul. I'm not rich. I'm not like wildly successful or anything like that. But I am really happy and satisfied in the job that I have. Um, and it took me quite, it was quite a journey to find that to get there. And so I just figured that I would kind of share the lessons that I learned along the way. So Vivian, pay attention. This is very important for you as you begin your adventure. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So this is me. Uh, currently, I'm a program manager at The Ohio State University. I run the Environment Natural Resource Scholars Program, which is a uh, program for first and second year students that have an interest in the environment. Um, I take them camping, hiking, backpacking, climbing, canoeing, kayaking, all that kind of stuff. I um, also teach a class on environmental ethics and that kind of stuff. Um, I have my Master of Science in Leadership, and I'm currently working on my doctorate in leadership, um, which I still can't believe that I'm doing, but Ohio State gives me free tuition, so why not? Um, I'm also a freelance photographer and videographer, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, I'm an Eagle Scout and avid outdoor adventurer, that kind of thing. Um, I was talking uh, earlier about how I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. This is my wife, Amy. Uh, this is uh, us in the uh, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, technically on the continental divide, but that's not important. Um, so I have uh, three core professional beliefs when I approach like work and um, anything I do in my professional and sometimes my personal well, uh, realm. Um, and the first is the only thing standing between you and your dream or goal is the work. And you can do the work. Um, Brandon mentioned, um, I like Hunger Games, student organization. Um, and essentially, it was just I wanted to do a campus-wide competition between like all the students um, and, you know, raise, uh, you know, funds and donate food for, for the Mid-Ohio Food Bank um, and other food banks. Um, and so, you know, I had looking at, you know, what I wanted to do, it was going to take 100 volunteers, it was going to take $10,000, it was going to take all these like moving parts and everything. And I remember I was in one of the buildings on campus and I was, there was this giant dry erase board. And I was like filling it with all these ideas and the phases and how it was going to work. And this guy came in um, and he's like, what in the world are you doing? Um, and I like kind of walked him through. I was like, this is my vision and this is what I want to do. And he stood there and he went, it's cool, but it'll never happen. And I was like, Paul, this is for you. And so months later, like it happened and it was great. Paul wasn't there, but I was like, take that, Paul. Uh, and, and really like that, that, that's where this belief comes from. You know, I had this goal, I had this vision and it was wildly over the top and, you know, in a lot of ways, inaccessible or unrealistic. Um, but I did the work and I got connected with the right people. I surrounded myself with a good team. Um, I clarified my vision. I passed on that passion um, and it, it happened. So, you know, the only thing that's really standing between you and your dream or your goal is a work. You can do the work. Um, you have to be the engine. You know, no matter what it is, whatever you're pursuing or whatever you're trying to do, you got to be the one to drive. No one is going to be driving the car for you. No one is going to, you know, come by and be like, oh, here's $10,000. Invest it however you want, you know. 
you have to be the engine. You have to be the one that's really pursuing the dream. Um, because that's the only way you get there. You have to be the one that's actually, you know, going forward and doing all the work um, and, you know, driving the car. Um, my other one is more like environmental, like leave no stone unturned. You just never know. You never know where uh, curiosity is going to take you. You never know where or when um, opportunity is going to strike. Um, and as I move through life, I really try and live by this one, leave no stone unturned and just let the curiosity take me, you know, wherever it does. Um, so the dream job is the one that I kind of have now. It's ENR Scholars. As I kind of said, it's a two-year experiential learning program, environmental issues, outdoor recreation, 100 of students with varying majors. Not all of them study the environment. Uh, they study business, chemical engineering, you know, whatever. They, they're all over the place. Um, our four main pillars are community service, conservation, adventure, um, and, you know, we do hiking, camping, backpacking. This is my first cohort. This is in 2018. This is us on a backpacking trip. And it's super fun. Oh my gosh, I absolutely love it. Um, it yeah. is so cool. What? Why? Why? Well, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you why. Um, also, this is how Brandon and I met. Um, we, we were both ENR scholars, and so it's really fun to come back and run the program that I was, you know, involved with and met Brandon through. Um, but it's the people. You know, these students they come to campus and they are entering this brand new world. They don't know anyone. They've never been to campus before, maybe, um, and they're starting out on this brand new adventure. And I get to kind of take them under my wing and just believe in them. Like I get to just help them find out who they are and what they want to do. Um, and, you know, I've been in this job for five years. And so they're starting to graduate. So I get to see these students who come to campus and they're shy and timid. Like, I don't know who I am and I don't know what I want to do. And I don't know. And, and now they're confident. And they, you know, believe in themselves and they're off to great things. Um, so it's so fun. But just because it's the dream job doesn't mean that I love every single aspect of it. Because it's working with students, it's a lot of nights and weekends, and I have a young kid, and I have my wife and family, and, like, you know, that takes away from them. Um, I also have this eternal battle with HR and our finance department, because they typically do, like, financing for research, and they're like, why do you need, like, all these, like, pumpkins? I'm like, I'm just putting on a Halloween party for my students, and they're like, well, what's the benefit to the university? I'm like, that the students stay here and actually enjoy being here? Anyways, you don't need to hear my gripes about HR. Uh, but so, like, even though it is a dream job, I just want to, like, be realistic and say that, like, I don't necessarily love every single thing about it. Like, I do love the job, but it has its gives and pros and cons and all that kind of stuff. Um, but so the journey begins at this place called Avenue, um, which looks just like taking a look at this image. It's pretty much as, like, far away from, like, this stuff that you can, like, possibly imagine, right? It's this giant warehouse. Um, so I graduated from Ohio State in 2014 with a degree in sustainability um, and was anxious to get out into the world, make an environmental difference, and sent out all these job applications and got literally nowhere. Um, but I was doing some networking at these different career fairs and events, and that kind of stuff, and it put me in contact with, like, the general manager of this facility. His name was TJ Harper, and he gave me a shot. And so he hooked me up with a full-time job as, like, the prop project administrator, I think my title was. Um, and I did everything. I did uh, auditing. I did quality assurance. I did some marketing communication work. Um, like, I was all over the place. I did not like it. Um, it was like the people were fine. I was very thankful to have the job. But the entire time, the, the entire two years I was there, I was always looking for another job. I was always on the job hunt. Um, and like trying to make the most of the experience, but it was just like, it was not the place for me. It just like, you know, based on what you've know about me so far, working like nine to five in a desk, like just sitting in my like little cube, like going through all these like six sigma, uh, like quality assurance stuff. It was awful, it was totally awful. Um, what? Yeah, I need a treat. At one point there were no windows. Yo, it, yeah, yeah, exactly, you know me, yeah. And I like, there was no grass in this facility. No grass, no grass. Abnet did like it was a it was a logistics company. It was shipping and receiving. They did like some like uh, digital and, and electronic uh, recycling, which was like kind of cool. But I didn't get anywhere near any of that kind of stuff. So like the two years that I was here it taught me two things. It taught me that the best time to look for a job is when you already have one because you're financially set. You can be looking for things. Um, and I also learned that knowing what you don't like about a job is just as important as knowing what you do want in a job. Um, I, it was, you know, this work was like all on the computer. Um, and it, I was like, I miss working with my hands. Like, I just want to go home and like shovel mulch in the garden or like whatever. Um, and so I learned that like, 
you know, being like having a physical dimension to to work was really important to me. Also, not sitting in a room with no windows is really important to me. Um, so I, yeah, um, you know, knowing what you don't like about a job is just as important as knowing what you do want. Um, sometimes we take the L and sometimes the L takes us. Um, so I was there for two years and after two years, the company restructured because they were having some difficulties and I got laid off. So there I was two years out of college with my friends, like, you know, all going on to greater and better things, bringing down, saving the coastlines of Texas. Um, and I am unemployed. And that like, that hurt, you know, like that hurts your, like your pride, your dignity a little bit. It's like, man, like, you know, and, and, you know, with the context of, I had spent two years in this, like in the Abnet job trying to find something and I hadn't found anything. And that's tough. Um, and so I found myself unemployed and, you know, I had, you know, like a month of um, uh, severance pay. And I was like, oh, like, I'll find something in a month. Like, I can do that. Like, I'm a young guy. I'm pretty charismatic. I've got some good skills. I've got a decent resume. It took me 10 months. I was unemployed for 10 months. Um, and that was tough. And because it took 10 months, that meant that, like, I didn't have a steady stream of income coming in for 10 months. And so I had to get real creative with my budgeting and thankfully I'd saved some money. And so that was helpful, but I started looking for any and all ways to like save money and, you know, um, and make cuts where I could. So I started, I learned how to cut my own hair and I was like, you know, tried to limit gas. And even when I did drive, I drove it like 55 miles an hour because that's like optimal for engine performance um, and like miles per gallon and like, you know, all these ways to try and save money any way that I could. Meanwhile, I'm applying to like at least 10 jobs a week, if not more. Um, and hearing back from some, you know, uh, it's, it's a typical like law of large numbers. Like if you apply to 100 jobs, maybe you hear back from 10. Maybe you get an interview from like one of those and that's it. In my case, I think over the, those 10 months, I applied to close to three to 400 jobs. And I had a couple interviews. Um, well, so I, I was applying to things that... I, it was essentially, I would set them out in batches of 10 and three jobs. I was like, I'm absolutely qualified for this. I can definitely do the work. You know, like a lot of it was like event management, event coordinating, because I had done a lot of events kind of stuff with the, you know, uh, student organization. Um, some of it, like at least three of it was in the environmental field. And then I had like my three or four that was just like reaching. Like there were three or four that I was like, I'm probably not qualified for this, but let, you know, like let's cast out, see what I get. I didn't get anything. <laughs> um, but there were a couple of jobs that I had applied for. There was one with the company. It was event coordinator position, absolutely qualified for, got the interview, went in, crushed the interview. Um, and like, you know, felt like pretty good. I was like, that's it. Like, I'm going to get out of this hole. Like, I'm going to get this job. It's going to be great. They also did uh, jobs like all over the world. So I was like, I'm going to get to travel for work. You go to Hong Kong. It's going to be great. And like a week later, I got a call and they said, you know, like, we absolutely loved you. But, and I was like, uh, but um, there was a guy who um, lived in Denver, Colorado, and had been an event manager for an art gallery for the past 10 years. And he was just trying to come back to Columbus to be with his mother, who was uh, her health was failing. And they were going to give him the job. And I was like, well, yeah, like he's got 10 years of experience. Like I can't compete with that, you know, and that was hard. You know, sometimes uh, like I think sometimes we're simply not the best. Um, and that was tough, you know, it was, it was very humbling. Um, but it's the truth, you know, there were a lot of jobs that I applied for that I was believed I could do this work. Like I can absolutely do this work, but whether it was a candidate had more experience than me, or I didn't necessarily fit the criteria or have like the proper, uh, you know, job requirement skills or whatever. Um, like I didn't get the job. Like sometimes we're simply not with that. And, and amongst that, of all that, like I learned that like defeat does not have to define you. With some people, they, they hit those roadblocks time and time again, you know, 10 months, hundreds of job applications. And sometimes I still hear back. Like it's been well over five years and they're like, hey, actually, we're going to go in a different direction with this job. I'm like, yeah, it's been five years. I'm not surprised. Um, but, you know, when you are facing rejection and defeat and failure time and time again for months, like, it can really take a toll on you. But you don't have to let that defeat define you. At no point, like, there were definitely times where I was very tempted to be like, uh, like, I just want to, like, whatever. Like, this is not going anywhere. I need to think of another option. Like, I should just, like, take a break or, like, whatever. But when you're, like, chewing through savings and everything, it's like, okay, well, I can't, like, really get, like, throw in the towel. Like, I got to keep going. Um, 
And, and we all have that choice in our lives. Like we all get to choose whether the seed is going to define us or not. Um, and I hope when, when those moments come, you choose not to. Um, because it can be very tempting sometimes. It can be very tempting to say like, no, this obviously is the direction for me. I need to like, you know, uh, re, re assess like what I'm doing and where I'm going. But um, the seat does not have to define you. And, some, and sometimes you're simply not the best. And that's what happens. So during those 10 months, you know, obviously like I'm applying for jobs, but there's only so much rejection you can take like in a, in a day. Um, and so I really started to invest in um, photography and videography. I had friends that had done that in college and I had kind of gotten into it a little bit, but I saw it as an opportunity to make some money as well. And so, um, you know, bought like a used camera on Amazon and um, I'm watching through YouTube videos all the time of like how to do this and how cameras work and how to get the best shot. And, and literally all the time, like from the moment I wake up to the moment I'm like going to sleep for the most part, like I'm researching and reading and watching videos on like how to do this. Um, because that's what it takes. Like that's what it takes to build a new skill. It takes hours. They say it takes 10,000 hours to become master of any one thing. Um, and I was like, I'm going to do it in months. And so I like, I really invested my time in uh, photography and videography. It was something I really enjoyed. It was something different. I got to work with my hands. I got to move out, like, you know, be moving do stuff outside um, and this grows and I, I still do this to this day. Um, but it was, it was great to like that first wedding that I did that I actually got a paycheck. It was just $300, but I was like, Ooh, like oh, here we go. Um, and so now I, I continue to do weddings. I travel for them sometimes. And it's, it's so fun to be with someone on like the biggest day of their life um, and help tell that story. Oh my gosh. I could regale you with like crazy stories from weddings that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, Miguel, uh, let's see. Uh, I'll tell you one of the most horrific moments and one of the, like, the best. One of the most horrific. I was at a wedding one time and the bride's dress caught on fire. Um, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, it was it was during, like, the ceremony went off fine, and it's during the recessional, and she had handles, like, along the, like, aisle or whatever, and she had a long train. And, uh, yeah, at one point, I, like, saw it out of the corner of my eye. I was like, oh, that's fire. Her dress is on fire. Thankfully, the groom was, like, he was pretty drunk, but he was also sober enough to like notice it. He like grabbed the dress real quick and like put it out. And honestly, that was probably the biggest failure I've ever had as a videographer because I totally missed it. I totally missed it because I was like, ah, and then I was like, not happy about that. The best, the best that I ever saw, I was shooting a wedding down in Charleston, South Carolina. And the couple was going to get married on this, um, like this old plantation by a river. And it was like gorgeous. They were going to get married under this big willow tree. And, um, you know, it's like the South and storms build in the afternoon. And so it's raining a little bit, not like super heavy, but like enough. And the string quartet that they had, uh, like, you know, gotten to do their wedding. They're like, well, we can't take our instruments out into the rain. And the DJ was like, I'm not dragging my equipment out into the rain. And the bride, bless her heart, she was very sweet, but she also had like a breakdown. She's like, I'm going to walk down the aisle in silence because we want to get married under the tree. And the mother of the groom was this like sweet Southern belle of a woman. And she was like, honey, you don't worry about a thing. We're going to take care of you. And she, and I think her grandma sang some hymn in two part harmony for her to like walk down the aisle. And it was one of those moments where like everything's going wrong. And then it's way better than it could ever have been. And I was standing there. I was like, magic is real. Like, it was so beautiful. It was, so beautiful. It was like under this tree and it was like a little wet, but still beautiful. Like, oh my gosh, it was incredible. So, yeah, I took those 10 months to really begin investing in myself, start this like freelance company kind of thing that I did. This is one of my friends' wedding that I shot on a beach in North Carolina. Um, and and you, like I never knew like where this was going to take me, and that was one of the funnest parts about it because I got to shoot friends' weddings, I got to shoot strangers' weddings all over the place, all different times, um, and that has just been like really, really rewarding. And I probably never would have been able to do this if I hadn't been unemployed. You know, I wouldn't have had the time and the energy and the drive to invest in myself as I did with it. So that was, that was like one of the best silver linings that came out of that time as I was able to, um, you know, like really invest in myself and, and change it. Um, after those 10 months, I did end up getting a job at Northwestern Mutual, um, which again, has nothing to do with the environment, has nothing to do with the outdoors, um, but like through um, like networking and connections and that kind of thing, um, I knew someone that worked there and they said, Hey, like I'm growing my, my business within Northwestern Mutual. Do you want to come and, and be a part of that? And I said, 
well, it beats being unemployed. So yeah, I didn't say that exactly, but like that was essentially the sentiment. Um, so I started working at Northwestern Mutual and I was there for about a year and a half, which was about a year and a half too long for me to work at Northwestern Mutual because again, it was like in a cube, in a room with no windows. Um, and, you know, nothing against the people that work in like financial institutions and everything, but it's just not my vibe. It's just not my vibe. Um, they all came in with like the pinstripe suits and looking real like fancy and nice and driving the nice cars. And I was like, I just want to be on my bike in the woods. Um, but this was also a really good opportunity because I learned a lot. I learned a lot about personal finance. I learned a lot about investing. I learned a lot about insurance. For a while there, I was actually uh, certified by the state of Ohio to sell life and disability insurance, which is still insane to me that that was a part of my life. Um, but as much as I did not like this job, and I like really did not like it, um, it was still a good learning experience to me. And, and it taught me that the path to success is not a straight line. Like there are times where you're gonna zig, times where you're gonna zag it. Like the journey and the path may lead all over the place. Um, but the important thing is that you never lose sight of where you wanna go. And, you know, I, again, I saw this as an opportunity where I can apply for jobs. Now I have income again. I can, you know, start to rebuild my savings a little, a little bit. Um, but the best time to look for a job is when you already have one. And so with this, I was like, okay, I'm much more financially set now. I can start looking for a job again, like, or, you know, kind of redouble my efforts. Um, and so I did. So, yeah, there's an opportunity to learn something from anyone and everything. And that was really came clear in, um, in this job because, again, this was not something I ever wanted to do um, and had never considered in my life, but it taught me financial uh, re responsibility. It taught me how to plan financially. Um, it taught me how to invest in those kinds of things. And all those are just like incredible things that I, I learned. And now with my students, I do an entire uh, class on personal financial planning and what it takes to reach retirement at a comfortable place and um, what all that looks like. So that was like really helpful for me. And then it helps my students out as well. Um, people are our greatest assets, not only in like the work that you do, but also in networking. Um, the first all three like professional full-time jobs that I've had have not been the traditional I applied, I interviewed, and I um, like got the job. I have gotten those jobs because of the people that I've talked to. The first two were absolutely through networking. I My job at Abnet, I don't even think I filled out an official application. Um, and I don't think I did that for Northwestern Mutual either. I did for Ohio State, but um, it was the people that I talked to that I met along the way that were the ones that were really able to help connect me. Um, what's that? Okay, so <clears throat> during the time that I'm working at Northwestern Mutual, I'm applying for all these jobs and everything. Um, and thankfully, you know, I had good people around me who were also looking out for jobs, looking out for opportunities for me, which I'm so thankful for them. Um, my wife being like my greatest champion, uh, was talking to, you know, people and, and Ohio State um, and she'll never like forget the one time where she was talking to a colleague and they were talking about how, um, like their job, but they were getting ready to move into a new job and, you know, asked her, what's her name? It's her name. Um, and said, you know, like, I really love the ENR scholar job, but like, it's time for me to move on. Like, do you know anyone? And Amy like was like, well, what about Brett? And Esther stopped her. Like as they were walking, it's like, oh my gosh, he would be perfect. Because like, she kind of like knew about me a little bit through Amy. Um, and so from that, um, like Amy came home and was like, you've got to hear about this job. Like you've got to hear about it. Like it's going to come open. You're going to be great for it. So once you know your goal, everything you do should be in its service. So from that moment on, I was like, I'm going to apply for that job. I'm going to, and I'm going to get that job. Like that was my goal. And I didn't go in to like this whole like application process to like get the job. I was like, I want to knock the freaking socks off. I want to walk out of there and then, and then have no doubt whatsoever that I was the candidate to hire, which is a little aggressive, I think. But also, like, after two years at Abnet, 10 months unemployed, and a year and a half at Northwestern Mutual, I was done. I was like, I want to have a job that I actually enjoy. So we're going to go. Um, so uh, the job was supposed to post in May. Or no, it was supposed to. I forget when it was supposed to post. It took like eight months. Like, the, the process was eight months. And before it even posted, I had emailed Esther. I was like, you know, found her email and reached out. I was like, hey, heard about this opening. Would love to get to meet you and talk about it. I'm very interested. And I heard nothing back. So I like waited a week and a half and I emailed her the exact same thing again. And I didn't hear back. 
And I emailed her a third time, and I didn't hear anything back. I tried calling her, nothing. Eventually, there was one day that I was, like, out on a run around campus. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to stop in her office. Like, I'm just going to do it. Hopefully, she will not see the sweaty mess that I am, but will see my initiative and my, like, perseverance and dedication to learn more about this app. And, of course, she was in the office that day, and I, like, knocked on her door. I'm like, hey, like, you never met me. Sorry I'm all sweaty. And I'm, like, very excited about this job. And so we got to connect at that point. Um, and, uh, you know, she told me that when it would be posting, but all this while, as it's getting ready to post, Amy's giving me updates through Esther, or Esther's giving me updates through through Amy that it's going to be master's required. And I didn't have a master's degree. And I was like, well, poop. <laughs> um, we'll see what about that. Like, I'll still apply. Like, regardless, I was still going to apply. But, you know, how they ranked it in the university and how they structured the job was going to be a big impact. Um, and then it became master's preferred. And then they kind of dropped the master's thing. Um, and I was like, that's great. Perfect. So I applied, I got an interview, um, and I needed to give a five to 10 minute presentation about myself and who I was. And then I also needed to give a 15 minute presentation on a workshop for students regarding leadership and outdoor recreation. Um, and then there was like the traditional panel interview. And I went in and I was like, okay, Brett, you're going to play to your strengths and you're going to like knock him out of the park. So for the uh, get like about me presentation. I made a video because of course I've been developing video skills um, and I wrote a speech and I memorized it um, and I created this like game because I love games um, for the leadership workshop portion um, and I practiced the interview in front of my wife in front of my friends and went over and over and over again um, even you know I, when I did the presentation about myself it was a video and it just played in the background and I gave the speech during it so I had to like have the timing down just right so I'd be like brushing my teeth and reciting like the, the speech or whatever, like for weeks. This was like what I did in my free time. I prepared for this because I was like, I'm going to like absolutely crush it out of the park. Like I don't want anyone else going in there and doing a good a job as me. And so that's what it did. That's what I did. And that's what it took um, and went in there. And of course, there were like errors and mistakes that I made like in the moment because you're nervous and everything. Um, but. I, I truly tried to go above and beyond because in my in my mind, as I had learned in the the job market is only one person gets a job, only one. And, you know, if you are applying to a job and there's an option for like resume and cover letter, you better have both. You better put both on there because someone else is going to have both on there. And if they're doing a little bit extra, then you need to do a lot. Extra. Um, you need to be the one that stands out. You need to go above and beyond because that's what it's going to take for you to get noticed and for you to actually, you know, get in there and get the interview and potentially even get the job. So that was my whole mantra. I was like, I'm going to go above and beyond. I'm going to turn it up to 11 um, and give it everything I got. So this is like kind of a game that I like to develop, which is like absolutely insane, as you can kind of tell, because there's like all these turn mechanics and like hexes. And like if you've ever played, uh, what is that? Um, yeah, Sellers of Catan. You can like kind of feel a little bit of that. Yeah, so this is like absolutely insanity. But I was going to like shock and awe. You know, I was like, wow, like this guy obviously put a lot of thought and effort into that. Um, and they were, they asked a lot of good questions about it, but it like worked out. Um, and so my strengths, like I love games. I love like developing games and creating games as I kind of did in undergrad with the, the whole Hunger Games thing, with the whole video thing. I wanted to play to my strengths because I knew that that would also help show who I am. Um, and it worked out. I got the job and I've been there for the past five years. This is a picture of me and my students on a, on a camp out. Um, playing Euchre. Um, and yeah, I have absolutely loved it. Absolutely love the students. It's fun to be back at a um, at a job that, you know, means something to me because I was an ENR scholar um, and it had such an impact on me, but also fun now to like see these students grow and develop and, and change and, and really do something that I'm passionate about, both in the environmental realm and the uh, like, you know, people kind of realm. But so it took me four years to like find the job that I actually liked and actually enjoyed. It took me four years. Um, it took hundreds of applications sent, um, and I personally believe that you know, like everything works out for a reason. Because at any moment, you know, during those like four years leading up to this job, if I had gotten another offer for another job, I would have taken it. And you know, especially during the unemployment or even time at uh, Northwestern Mutual, if I would have gotten another job, like I would have taken it, and I, maybe I wouldn't have heard about this job. You know, maybe I wouldn't have heard about it. Maybe I wouldn't have applied, and my life would be on a considerably different trajectory. Um, I, 
you know, picked up a dozen new skills along the way, whether it was at, you know, Abnet, Northwestern Mutual, or videography. Um, I started that one business, which I still do today, which is still a lot of fun. Um, and I landed that one, that one dream job, which is like truly so, so, so much fun. Um, so that's kind of like my professional, uh, like journey, uh, and some of the and stuff that I learned along the way, but, um, like what questions do you have about any of that, about the lessons, about the wisdom or, or, um, you know, are there situations in your life right now that you're kind of going through that, um, you know, you're curious about how some of these might apply to those. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Abnet or at Abnet? Okay. Okay, so here we go. So um, the let me think if I can remember the line of con like connection. I met someone at a career fair who um, was like, oh, like you know, you know, we we hit it off. We like talked a little bit, like personally and professionally. Um, and it, you know, I communicated to them that I was like really looking for a job, and they're like, oh, well, I know this guy. He works with um, like the government. I don't think he was like a. I think he was like a policy advisor or. Some kind of yeah 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 it was a spy yeah he was a spy um, and and he's like oh you should talk to him he's like very well connected who would be able to like connect you to better people so I met with him and he and I had a, a really good conversation and he connected me with another person who I cannot remember but I do remember being late to that uh, to that meeting I was meeting him on campus and like my alarm went off, or I think he like called me and I was still in bed and I was like ah well I'm doing stuff and so I like you know, throw on the suit and like run down there. Um, and thankfully, he was he was nice. Um, and then he connected me with PJ Harper, who was the general manager of it, of the Abnet facility in Columbus. So that's like five people that I had to go through to meet the one that, or like four or five people that I had to talk to and connect with to meet the one person who could actually give the job. And then even then, TJ Harper connected me with, with Pat, Kathy Passman, who was the actual person that hired me. So you know, it, there there were times where I was like, "This is a wild goose chase. Like, why are you even doing this?" Like this is gonna lead nowhere, but but again, you know, you never know. You gotta leave no stone unturned. You gotta be able to, um, you know, continue on that path and follow it till it's till its end. And thankfully, that path led me to a job at the end of it. Now, what do you think, Vivian? Questions? <laughs> uh, I got married uh, while I was at Abnet. Yeah. And um, my wife was in grad school when I was unemployed as well. So, yeah, because she had finished her undergrad and then was getting her master's degree. Um, and so she had, like, a little bit of a stipend coming in, which, like, helped uh, and everything. But, you know, it was a grad stipend. So, like, <laughs> was pretty much an upper end. Yes, she uh, she is the director of alumni engagement um, for the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. Um, so yeah, it's like kind of fun. Our offices used to be right across the street from each other. So I would like go over there and say here <laughs> and now, but, um, but yeah, so she also works for Ohio state and, and really enjoys it. Yeah. Moved offices. Yeah. Moved offices. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, she did get a new job and that's like, so she was, um, the, she was like head of recruiting for, and like prospective students for the college of food, ag and environmental sciences. And then she became the director of alumni engagement. So yeah. Huh? Carmac. Uh, so, sh so I am in Cotman Hall, which is on Midwest yeah. campus, which is right across the street from Ag Admin. And she, her office is currently in the uh, the first floor of Riverwatch Tower. If you're familiar with, yeah, it's no, it's not nice. <laughs> like there was a, she had to leave her office for a while because it was leaking sewage from the ceiling. No, it's not nice. Yeah. Which is funny because like advancement is like the money making fundraiser development officer like office and it's in like the worst place. But yeah, well they're moving now. They're moving to a new building which is much nicer and sorely needed. So um so yeah, it's fun that we both share Ohio State and there are times where she gets to go to these like really nice donor events and I get to be her arm candy and just like hang out and eat all the free food and talk to cool people, I guess. But yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I know, right, yeah, it's awful. <laughs> yeah, it's really awful, yeah. Yeah. Very Yeah. Environment Oh yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of it is helpful because I get to hold their grades ransom. You know, <laughs> that's not, I don't know. Actually, yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things that I learned in my, my master's uh, program was this thing called emotional labor, um, which is essentially like, if you get excited about something, they'll get excited about something, which I had seen in my life about, you know, with like the whole hunger games thing and, and competition. Like I had this passion, I had this vision, but I had to be the engine and no one else was going to believe in it if I didn't believe in it. And so, you know, when I pitched the idea to, like, I remember specifically, I met with um, one of the directors of the Barnes and Noble bookstore because I wanted their support. Um, and I came, you know, dressed the suit and I had a presentation for him, but I talked with fervor and I was like, you know, this is something I really believe in. This is something that's really cool. This is something that we can do together. And he, he like, you, I could tell that he was just really picking up on that vibe, really picking up on that energy. Um, and he was like, we'd love to partner. We'd love to even give you like a $500 book scholarship for the winner. And I was like, that's more than I could have ever asked for. That's great. Um, but, you know, especially with engaging students who, you know, are de their demands are all over the place. Like, you know, they have academics and student orgs and family and friends and relationships and all that. Like they're being pulled in all these different directions. The best way I have found to, um, you know, really engage them and get them to commit to, you know, activity or service or whatever is to just, you know, really employ that emotional labor. Like really get excited about it, um, hype it up. And, um, you know, part of the, the benefit is I've, you know, cultivated a leadership council of students um, because, you know, I can, you know, say like, hey, we're going to do this like really fun thing. And some of them will be like, all right, yeah, like, that's fun. But if I can get the students to like really engage and be like, guys, we're going to do this really fun thing, that's, they're much more likely to be engaged and actually commit and join. Um, so part of it is, you know, leveraging people because they're our greatest asset, you know, sharing that passion and let that passion trickle down through the community or the structure of the organization. Um, to really like get people um, engaged. But, you know, I think that the, the temperament, the personality, the passion, the energy and the emotional labor that you put forth into something, you know, the, the, the more you send out those right vibes, the more you'll cultivate engagement. Yeah. Great question. Other questions. You once told me that this new generation of students, everybody has a mission. Mm -hmm. It seems like more and more everybody's saying they, they are not only going to make a difference, they're going to like save the world. But they all yeah. have, I think a lot of the times, our generation, we hear a lot of things about how, from the older generations, about how we screwed everything up and, and we're not wanting to work. And Can you give us some hope based on because I think our generation is a lot less prone to gripe about the, the next generation. But can you give us, like, because you're in a unique position that you are constantly in touch with that next generation and yeah. mentoring them and listening to the way that they want to change the world. Yeah. Can you give us some, like, stories or, or examples of what you're seeing and, and why there's hope for the world? Yeah. The, um, so working with students that are interested in the environment, like, climate doom is something that we address all the time. And I see it on my students all the time. You know, they see these environmental issues that are, you know, becoming more pervasive and more, uh, more present in the world. Um, and they just feel that like hopelessness, like, what do we do? How do we even do this? Like, who am I to think that I could make change or whatever? And I tell them that they are like the hope, like every time I, I feel that same thing, I look at them and I, I see the hope. Um, this generation is vastly different. Um, millennials growing up, um, or uh, Gen Z is, is vastly different in a lot of ways. Some of them are very surprising. Um, one thing that I, I learned on a spring break trip with them was their media literacy is just off the charts. You know, like when I was growing up, music, uh, you know, proliferated through culture at the speed of radio and mix CDs. But with them, they've had Spotify their entire lives. And so, you know, we're driving and I was like, oh, like, what well, music should we listen to? And they're like, oh, put on Neil Diamond and James Taylor. I was like, how do you, what? Like, how do you know, like, all these people? Because they they have that media literacy. And so they've grown up with, with all of these um, assets and resources at their fingertips, um, which gives them a very interesting, unique blend of perspectives. Um, but honestly, I think that they, they, they more than anyone, know the challenges in the world and know the problems in it, whether it's financial or health or, you know, environmental or, or whatever, like they are well aware of it because they have been blasted by, 
media and social media and all those things with it from a very young age. They are so attuned to the challenges and problems in this world, and they have problems with it, but they are approaching it in a vastly different way because, you know, they have all these new, like connectivity has never been easier. Um, you know, linking up with people who share passions, who share ideas um, for how we can resolve issues. Um, you know, they they are very quick to to research. They're very quick to explore new ideas and new thoughts, and they're very open to to whatever. Um, and I think that a lot of the time they see challenges and issues in the world today, and they look at what we're doing now, and they're like, well, this isn't working. So what will work? What is working? And they look to those things first. Um, so, so the hope that I, I really have with, like, you know, Gen Z and eventually Gen Alpha, because I think they'll be very similar, um, is that they just perceive the world in a vastly different way because of their upbringing and the way that they, you know, interacted with information and, and um, like, issues and that kind of thing. But they're seeing it with a brand new perspective because they are the true digital natives and they have all these new skills and apps and websites and, and resources at their disposal um, with things that I, you know, I don't even have. Like, I believe that there will come a day when a student will ask me to like code something and I'll be like, Oh, actually I like, I don't really know how to code. And they're like, how do you not know how to code? Like everybody knows how to code, you know, like you don't know, like, right. Yeah. But, but really like, like I have like, yeah, like J Gen Z, like my students use chat GDP, like incredibly proficient. They are so good at it. Um, and you know, whether it's like making tools or, you know, forging a document or like, you know, whatever, like, they are they are incredibly adept at it um, because you know they're at that time in their lives where this is being introduced and they're learning how to use it, um, and that's one thing that I'm really trying to utilize is like how do I employ our AI as a as a skill as a as a you know a tool um, because that's what the future is going to be. Like Gen Z is already taking to it very quickly, um, and because of that, they'll be able to solve problems in a vastly new way. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, other questions? We've got a question. Please. Yeah, what's up? Um, kind of standing off what Brandon just said. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of interested in like, how you avoided kind of getting a rut. Uh, when you <laughs> when you say you're working with like a neutral and didn't like it, or yeah. you were you applying to jobs? Yeah. Uh, I find sometimes. Oh, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. The ruts, oh my gosh, which are so real. You know, like, I, especially at Northwestern Mutual, I felt that burnout, I felt that rut. Like, I get home at the end and just, I, I don't want to do anything. Like, I don't want to do anything. Um, and that's tough because it's like, like you got to do something or, you know, nothing's ever going to change. Um, and, and the thing that was most helpful for me is, you know, I grew up hearing the phrase, anything worth doing is worth doing right. And then I heard anything worth doing is um, anything worth, I forget, what was the term phrase? It was, it was not that. It was like anything worth doing is just worth doing. Like it doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, um, going out, like, you know, physical activity is a, big, is a big part of my life. And, you know, even doing like a 10 to 20 minute kettlebell workout is better than not doing anything at all. Yeah. And so with that mentality, I was like, okay. I'm exhausted. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to apply to one job. Like I, I, like I call it chunking in my mind. Um, like writing is another big thing. And another way that I kind of like got through this run is like, I like to write a lot and um, like mostly fiction and that kind of stuff. And that was kind of like an escape. Um, but I have like writing partners who send me stuff, you know, they, they'll send me like a, fee, a whole book and I'm like, I'm a pretty, pretty busy guy, but like, but I want to like read through it and like get my feedback and that kind of stuff. And so in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to do one chapter, <laughs> like just one chapter. Like it, I don't have to do all of it, like, you know, kind of taking the pressure off of myself. You know, in scouting, they taught me this thing, which is like kind of a weird thing. But like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. And which I like, I need a better way to phrase that because like a lot of my students are vegetarians. And, like nobody likes elephant meat anyway. Maybe. Um, but, but so that is kind of how I like got through the rut what, or the ruts why, when I encountered them was I would like, do a little bit like I was like anything that I do is better than nothing um and and then at the end of the day I was like okay at least I did something you know and sometimes I would like you know get into applying a job and I'd find a rhythm be like all right well then I'll do another one you know like if I find that in if I find that like movement and energy in the moment then I'll just let it carry 
I talk with my students about like motivation versus discipline. Like if you ever, if you wait for the motivation to come, like you'll never get anywhere because you'll always be waiting on motivation. But if you build in discipline and even if it's just like a little bit every single day, you know, like if you want to become a runner and like run a 5k, even if you just run like one mile a day, that's seven miles in a week versus, you know, maybe you ran like two or three one day when you felt like it. And so, you know, really buckling down and, and relying on discipline and like chunking was, was what really helped get me through those ruts because, you know, at the very least at the end of the day, I was like, okay, I, like I wasn't happy about it. I didn't want to do it, but at least I did a little something and a little something is vastly superior to doing nothing at all. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of days where I did not want to, and I kind of like kicked and screamed the whole way, but I was like, nope, Brett, if you want things to change, you got to be the engine. You got to like, you got to do it. So chunking was really, really helpful. Yeah. Jumping off of that and some of your, like you said, gold fund, uh, follow up on Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson? Yeah. Who's, who's Jordan Peterson? Oh. Interesting. I'll have to look him up. I haven't heard of him. Okay. Jordan Peterson. I'll look that up. Does he really? <laughs> I, I, there's a part of me in my mind that thinks I have a really good Kermit impression, but I don't. And sorry, John. Uh, no, I like literally can't even try. It's not even good. Um, it's, and it's not one of those moments where I'm like, oh, I'm being so humble. Like, please ask me again. Like, that's I just can't do it. Um, yeah. Other questions? Non Muppets related. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's just inspiring the next generation. I don't necessarily have a great, like, like I learned very quickly in college that I do not have like an analytical mind, like math and chemistry on an abstract conceptual basis, I think is really fascinating. But on the analytical like level, I like can't do it at all. Like I, I am just not like a left brain person or right brain person or whatever that is. Um, like I can't do that. And, but I am good at connecting with people. And I am good at, um, you know, like helping people find their passion, find their best way forward and, and helping them get excited about those kind of areas. Um, and so, you know, really our, our hope in, in the environment as much as it can be in like a future technology or a new way of doing things or, or whatever, but really it's got to be the people. Like where are the things that have to change in order to have a better equilibrium with our environment? Um, and like people are fun, you know? It's great to talk to people. It's great to build coalitions and, um, you know, get people to, like, just think differently about the way that they interact with their their surroundings and, and how their individual, you know, habits can impact the world. And, um, you know, that for me is, is where my real passion lies. You know, I'd love to say, like, really interested in this, like, really cool, like, science that's going to change the world or whatever. Like, you know, I love reading the articles and hear about, like, what's coming out, but, you um, the way I describe it to my students is like, if any of you are familiar with the Disney movie Hercules, um, you know, I'm not Hercules, I'm Philatides. You know, I'm like, I'm the trainer of champions, you know, like I love like bringing students in and like get them ready and second them up and then sending them out into the world and being like, oh, that's my student, look at what they're doing, you know, like I'm, I am Philatides. What? Yeah, but oh, it's not old. It's yeah, yeah, just a train. Yeah. Because again, I don't necessarily have any like technical or hard skills that are going to change the world or like do great things for the environment, but I can inspire people who do have those things. So that's where I focus on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yeah. This is kind of a random one. Yeah, sure. But for ChatGPT, maybe your answer is the best school in Miami. Yeah. 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 Great question. Um, I mean, that's a big conversation on the administrative level and the faculty level right now is like, how do we do this with chat, chat, GT or what, you know, whatever. Um, and, and there are some like filters that are going in place to help like filter through, um, and like, you know, recognize like AI footprints and that kind of stuff in the data. Um, for me personally, it's the way that I 
um, like pose assignments for my class and everything. Like I make it much more personalized. Like they have to personalize it as part of the assignment. Yeah. And you know, AI can't like rec or like replicate like the personal experience because I'm like, okay, well you didn't do that because I know you, and that's like you know. So yeah, the, the way that we ask questions and the way that we assess understanding and knowledge, I think will have to change with the advent of AI and the way that students are using it. Um, there's also a part of me that's like, if you can game the system, like game the system, but also like, that's not great because then like, are people really learning something, you know? Um, but I think that we will see a shift in, in the way that education is done in this country. And we're already seeing it a little bit, you know, less and less colleges are requiring um, like the ACT and the SAT, which I think is a great idea because it's not a good assessment of knowledge. You know, I have a friend who scored like a 19 on his his act or whatever and now he's a drone pilot in the in the air force and does incredible things and is like one of the he's like going to dc as a um as like a contractor as like a advisor for like some drone operation like he's wicked smart but the act didn't say that yeah. you know so i think that the way that education is conducted and and operates in this country is going to change and it's going to have to change with you know with the advent of ai and you know i think that there are a lot of things that make like grading and you know intelligence assessment easy and i think we're gonna have to get away from those a little bit because yeah it's very easy to just write in a uh, a prompt and it will spit you out the essay and that kind of thing and while some filters will help it's not going to catch all of them and so there are a lot of conversations going on about that um but also I, I tell my students i'm like look this is your journey and if you want to you know, do the absolute minimum and like cheat your way through it, essentially, like it's only hurting you. Like it's not going to hurt me. Like I will, you know, give you the grade that the paper warrants and what I believe you did. Um, but in the end, you know, if you're just going to skate through this, you're eventually going to find yourself in a job and not know how to do it. And then you're going to lose a job and that's mm -hmm. on you, you know, because you're like, oh, well, maybe I should have taken the time to learn this like specific thing. And <laughs> You know, and I try and impress that on them and like, you know, let's look at the greater consequences of your actions. You're choosing a short term solution for a long term problem. Um, and and that's the reality. And maybe they listen and maybe they don't. And I think everything will balance out in the end because, you know, those who can do the skills and will get the job and be successful and those who can't and cheated their way through won't. And the people who are smart enough to use AI and like skate through courses like you know there will always be acceptance to the rule but um yeah, you know in conclusion like i think education is changing and will have to change with ai um but also i just try and press on students like it's your journey and you know we're here to help you and help prepare you and i understand the temptation but if you really want to like be successful later in life like the way that you do things now matters you know i always try and impress on my students like this is like this program and what you do in it is as much a learning experience as any class. So like this is the time to fail and try new things and you know test your metal and see you know where your strength lies. Um, because it's low stakes here. Like maybe an event doesn't go so well or maybe you don't get a good grade, but eventually you will like you know be having to do the same things, but your job will be on the line. Um, so you know just really try and press on them, you know, yeah. like let's think critically about the consequences of action and, and what that looks like. But it is a fascinating question and so whenever I was a secondary supervisor of technology, and we had uh, one of our teachers, first year teacher, who just out of college, one of the things he would do for our class specifically, out of the school today, if you could turn into a cell phone, that would count as turning into a cell phone. And it taught me, so it was cutting edge. Yeah. It taught me how to use the cell. Yeah. So much more helpful than teaching anyone. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah. A, right. A yeah. And and I think that's what, how we need to, like, if, if Ohio State were to listen to me, like, that's really how, like, we need to have classes on, like, how to best use AI, because those are the, like, AI is a, is a tool that we can use to optimize the way we do everything. Yeah. And right. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Like AI is probably so much filtered out of the school that I would like to kind of thing. So if you can become an expert in whatever you are, AI can't promise. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter necessarily what field you're in. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Vivian, anything? Did you seem very happy? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> so you're you're one of the people who has fairly recently been through college and is now observing people go through college. Yeah. Did you have to things that are better than when you were going through, things that are worse? The food's probably better. <laughs> uh Oh, man, I have so many questions that branch off of that. Like, are you talking about, like, the student experience, like, the university approach to the student experience? Well, like, when I think about what we put this question, there was a certain level of preparedness and then a certain mindset. Yeah. And then we were here. Yeah. And this thing is kind of a small change. Yeah. When you compare those three variables, let's say, the mindset, and the interface with the university. I think it's a great question. I think honestly, the answer is it's apples to oranges because the millennial generation is very different than the Gen Z generation. And right now, and I can only speak to like Ohio State and the university, but it seems like Ohio State is now transitioning to like, how do we best support Gen Z because their needs are different? Like mental health is a much bigger issue um, that we see in students and, you know, the way that they are connecting with people, especially post pandemic is very different. Um, and so, you know, it is different, it, it's, it's different. You know, uh, the students that we were um, and like, you know, our general like culture and what we brought to the university is different than Gen Z, and like some things remain the same, but um, but honestly, I think that like the university is you know spending much more money on wellness, and you know like Ohio State currently has like nine to ten dimensions of wellness, and they're all different. They all have like different ways that they're trying to you know interact with students and all that. Um, so it, it's hard to say exactly because I think it is pretty different. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think I see students who are just as passionate. Um, maybe some students who are just much more zeroed in on what they on what they want to do and like what's out there and what they can get involved with. Um, but but yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I don't know if I can really answer that question super thoroughly because I just see like such a difference in like millennial generation to Gen Gen Z. You know, yeah. But it is interesting to ponder. Uh, that's that's the trouble. Um, if if they would compensate me appropriately for where I am in my career path, yes. But my eternal struggle with HR, like I don't need to get into it. Uh, but like I have a growing family, and so the financial needs are are changing. And um, you know, my, right now I'm looking at like my doctorate will take three to four years, and at that point I'll take a look. Um, I've had some interesting conversation with some other people about like the leadership center at Ohio State and potentially working for them. Um, and, you know, if I, in the next like three to five years, like that would mean that I'd work with, you know, scholars for about 10 years. And it is a program that requires energy and passion. And I have those things, but if there ever came a day where I felt like myself starting to slip on those, those areas, I would be like, it's time for someone else. Because for the program to be the best that it can be, it needs someone who's willing to give it all of that. And if there ever comes a time where I feel like I can't or like my priorities and everything have shifted, then it is time for someone else because, you know, I don't want to give 75 or even like 90 percent to a job that deserves 100. Yeah. So. So, I mean, again, I'm always open. I'm always looking. Best time to find a job is when you already have one. So if the right opportunity came along, I would definitely be open. But yeah, open and interested. But um at this point, I'm happy with where I am, and I've got like three to five years of the doctorate, so um, that's like my three to five year plan, so to speak. And after that, we'll we'll see what opportunities open up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I get like tuition assistance and some full time there, so yeah, I take like two or one or two classes every every semester. It also just helps me like stay connected with my students because like when they're going through midterms, I'm going through midterms, and I'm like. You know, I'm, I'm never, like, apathetic or I, I'm ignorant to, like, what they're going through. 
And I think that's really helpful because, you know, especially when you're working with students, I think the worst thing that you can do is what it, is remember what it's like to be a student. Because like the student experience is like, there's so much going on and there's so many demands. And the more in tune I am with those things, the better I am in my job. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 uh, yeah, I, yeah. So right now I'm taking um, a quantitative stats class and an equity and social identity class, and I have like yeah, full time work plus like videography stuff, and um, finding balance for that can be tough. Yeah. You know, there are, there are times where where things have to give. There are times where the first thing to sacrifice is sleep, you know, and and that's just the way it is. Um, I try and be really disciplined with my time. Like honestly, discipline is like the the silver bullet, the key to you know making sure you're on on with things. Like there are times that I just want to like doom scroll on TikTok, but I'm like, Brett, you have five more minutes, and yeah. then you have to be productive. Yeah. Um, so so really just trying to be um, disciplined with my time tends to be the best thing. And also like when I when can I double up on things? Because like there are times where I'm in on Zoom meetings and they're just like talking about. I'm like, I could do some schoolwork during the meeting. Like, I don't really have to be that attentive. Um, so, yeah, being creative with like time overlaps, um, but discipline is like tried and true the best way to do it because you know I want to make like my family is like absolutely the, my priority, and then my job, and then schoolwork and video art, all like all the kind of stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like do school work during lunch. Um, you know, if there is reading, I try and, um, you know, listen to it during commutes and that kind of stuff or like while I'm in the shower, you know, like just trying to be creative with like, how can I maximize my time and like what I'm doing with it? Um, uh, so anything above 5,000 like blends together a little bit. Um, like even in my undergrad, like I took an 8,000, 9,000 level course. And now like my, my equity class is a 5,000 level. My stats is 6,000 level. The stats class I took last semester was an 8,000 level. So it like all kind of blends together a little bit. Um, well, so yeah, I, I think it depends on the course. Yeah. I think it, I think it really depends. Um, and you could always like wait in. Um, yeah, you could always like take a class and just see how it kind of fits and everything. Yeah, I think you can't pick it like, uh, yeah, pass fail participation. Yeah. Yeah. And th I mean, there's some like, yeah, there's some great classes out there. Oh my gosh. That are like so fun. Sure. Yeah, I struggle constantly with like the whole GPA thing, and and just like reminding myself that like who cares about the GPA? Like who, like it doesn't like it's a number and it does not reflect like my ability or my intelligence. But also I'm like, but I really want you know. <laughs> it, 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 the content just, like push and pull struggle, but um, but yeah, I would say just get like give it a try, you know. And if if it finds out that it's like you know you can't fit it in, then you can't fit it in. But you never know. Leave no stone unturned. Oh, ice cream. Oh, ice cream is always a related topic. Yes, it does. You know, especially doing more like, you know, Tuesdays, I'm typically not home until like 830. Um, and, you know, there are weekend trips and that kind of stuff. And thankfully, my supervisors so far have been very flexible with that. Um, and, and part of that is, you know, you, you develop trust and, and, and build that. Um, part of it, I think, is just like the management that I've had. My, um, my current supervisor is, is also a, like an older millennial. And her philosophy is like, look, if you're getting the work done, I don't care when you're in the office. And that is like something that I've earned with like building trust and like and the quality of work that I provide and everything. Um, but part of it also is just like so thankful for me as like a family man to, you know, have that kind of flexibility. And I understand that that is a very kind of unique situation. Um, but it's it's also something that I never, ever, ever take advantage of because I understand that it's a slippery slope and a fine line. 
And that is something that she's trusting me with and something that's very beneficial to me. And so I never want her to ever think like, is he really doing the work? Or is he like cutting corner? They're, you know, trying not to like do whatever. Like I always make sure that I'm still operating at 110%. It just might look a little different of like where and when that's taking place. Um, so it is nice that I can flex my hours a little bit. Um, and, you know, be, be able to prioritize what I need to prioritize on what any given day. Um, but also like, yeah, some of the like weekends and night stuff, like it takes a toll on, you know, I have to sacrifice family time and, uh, time with friends or homework or whatever. Um, and so I'm very thankful for that balance and, and the trust that my supervisor has in me. And it's, yeah, something that I never take for granted and I never want to take advantage of. Yeah. Well, with the yeah, absolutely. Yeah, super fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been super fun. Yeah.